This is Agriculture Today, and I'm Samantha Bennett with the K-State Radio Network. Joining us this Wednesday from the Kansas Farm Service Agency is Farm Program Chief Todd Barrows. He shares fast approaching deadlines for acreage reporting in ARC PLC, as well as all the information the Kansas FSA currently has on the new ERP Phase 2 and PARP, otherwise known as PARP, programming set to begin in the new year. Also ahead, K-State Research and Extension Horticultural Entomologist Raymond Floyd is on a mission to share more information on the role that beneficial insects can play. We end this Tuesday's programming with our weekly Beef Cattle Institute's Ask the Experts. This week, K-State experts Brad White, Bob Larson, and Philip Lancaster answer a listener's question on how to best cull a small herd with confirmation issues. That and more is coming up ahead on Agriculture Today. This is Agriculture Today. We are joined now by one of our friends from the Kansas Farm Service Agency, Todd Barrows. He is the Farm Program Chief with the Kansas FSA State Office. So, Todd, thanks for joining us, first and foremost. Yeah, thanks a lot, Samantha. It's always good to come back and uh, give it an update. I have several topics that I wanted to discuss and bring up, those being from crop acres reporting to maybe some risk management and the non-insured assistance program, or commonly known as NAP. ARC PLC sign up. And then we have a couple new programs that was recently announced in a press release by the secretary. And we'll talk about those ERP phase two and PARP or pandemic assistance revenue program. Let's get right into it then with acreage reporting. I know there's some upcoming important deadlines quickly approaching. So let's talk through those. Yeah, I wanted to put that at the forefront because that is quickly approaching on Thursday, December the 15th. So right around the corner. It is a final day for producers to time report their fall planted acreage and perennial acreage crops for the upcoming 23 crop year. So if you have not done so yet, you need to be making an appointment with your local county FSA office to report those fall planted crops. If you do not contact your local office by December 15th, we can still accept that acres report, but there is a penalty fee with that for reporting after the deadline. Absolutely. So mark your calendars and get ready to get that done and turned in right away. And you mentioned risk management and the NAP program as well. Can you explain a little bit more on those? Yeah, I wanted to talk about that because a lot of times we forget about some of the tools in our toolbox and looking at the drought monitor for not only our state, but surrounding surrounding states, we continue to see a heavy influence on drought being extreme or exceptional levels. So I wanted to talk about the NAP program and just remind producers, you know, under the non-insured assistance program, we do have a tool that can be used in situations to provide some production and limit that commodity or production risk. Those are for crops where federal crop insurance to the risk management agency is not necessarily available. Like with the majority of our state in Kansas, two-thirds to three-fourths of it being in extreme to exceptional drought. As you look forward to the 2023 production year, you might want to be thinking about and discussing with your local FSA offices what options are available to provide some crop Crop protection and mitigate that risk on those livestock forage crops. NAP has been around for a lot of years, but recently in the last five, we've increased the coverage level into a two tier system where we still have the basic NAP coverage, which is 50 55, but we also now have buy up coverage. So basic coverage provides 50% production and loss coverage at 55% of established price level while buy-up coverage starts at the 50% production loss coverage, same as basic, but it's 100% price level and increases on 5% increments on the production side up to 65%. Now, the one thing to remember, though, is there is a premium fee for the buy-up coverage, and buy-up coverage is not available for grazing crops. Absolutely. Some good reminders for sure. And continuing on with good reminders, ARC PLC is another popular program, and sign up for that is quickly approaching as well. Yep. ARC PLC program is one of the bigger programs, and we are currently in that enrollment sign-up period for the 2023 crop year. And while that deadline for enrollment is not until March 15th, I just want to discuss it with our producers and rangers in order to maybe help with the office workflow and just put out some uh, encouragement there. 
after the first of the year in January because of a couple of new programs that are targeting to be implemented at that time frame. That's going to be an extremely busy time for our county offices and our staff. So I would like to encourage producers, maybe they want to go ahead and that normally desire to wait, and I understand that, to make the best decision to see what the commodity prices do or crop conditions, whether they improve or worsen between now and that March 15th. Go ahead and schedule your enrollment now. And then certainly if something changes that we aren't aware of as far as a price change for commodity or you see crop conditions change, you can always come in up to March 15th and revise that enrollment. But at least you got your in in the door and we got you covered if need be. Right now, we're at 30% enrollment for Kansas as compared to last year. So we got up two-thirds of the way to go. So yeah, I would just encourage, you know, look at the forecast, look where we're at today, go ahead and get that appointment, get in, get that taken care of, because it is going to get really busy after the first of the year. Great advice for sure. I mean, we'll probably feel like we've blinked and March 15th will be here. So great to keep in mind. Absolutely. Yeah. And then you wanted to also talk about this new ERP phase two and the PARP program. So let's talk through those. Yeah, I wanted to bring those up because those were recently in the news and the announcement with Secretary Vilsack. And we are getting questions from producers on those. So I just wanted to elaborate a little bit about those two programs and let the listeners know, the farmers and ranchers, while we want to answer their questions and we feel for them because there's some that desperately need the benefits, right now... Understand we are limited to the amount of information that we can discuss on those two programs because of the Office of Management and Budget in D.C. has not signed off on the federal regulations or what we call the rule yet. And while we do anticipate a final decision for the rule being made shortly after the first of the year, until that determination has been finalized, things can change. And so at this point in time, we really can't talk much about the program. We can just kind of elaborate on the basics and what was announced in the press releases. So even though, you know, you ask the county office questions and they're not responding, it's because they really can't until that finalization of the federal rule or the federal regulations gets published. Now, what we do know And what I can share with you is that these will be both revenue-based programs, first of their kind as far as FSA administration. They're based on, and you'll hear this new term, allowable gross revenue. And we'll uh, be sure and have more information coming out on what is allowable gross revenue. And that will... Informa- that uh, allowable gross revenue term will be coming from your IRS Schedule F and or your IRS 4835 farm rental income or expense forms. Uh, again, allowable gross revenue is going to be a new term that you're going to have to familiar- familiarize yourself with, and, and that's what we'll have to get used to. All producers will be eligible to participate in these two programs, both the ERP Phase 2 and the PARP program, or P-A-R-P, as Samantha said, regardless of participating in previous programs. And why I bring that up is because just if you got an ERP Phase 1 benefit, that doesn't limit you from applying from Phase 2. And then, as I stated just a minute ago, We are anticipating a January kickoff of these two programs. And since all producers potentially could be eligible for those programs, we are looking like that will be a very heavy workload for our county offices. So any other programs you can get done before then will be appreciated. Uh, We're looking at most likely mid to late January for that kickoff. Allowable gross revenue is a producer certification. And producers, you will need to work with your CPAs and tax preparers on how to determine what is your qualifying revenue from your tax forms. And if you do not have a CPA or tax preparer, FSA is entering into and there will be a list of cooperative contract providers you can contact and also help you through that process. Just in short, PARP or PARP will cover a revenue shortfall during the 2020 pandemic year when compared to the higher revenue year of 2018 or 2019 tax year, 
And that would have been that revenue shortfall would have been caused by loss of market availability for the pandemic. ERP phase two is also a revenue shortfall. And this is during tax years 2020, 2021, and or 2022 caused by crop loss from an elder qualifying weather event occurring in calendar years 2020 and 21 when compared to a benchmark tax year selected by the producer. So similar programs, but yet different. Absolutely. And a lot to keep in mind and a lot still to come in terms of information. So listeners, stay tuned for that. But Todd, as always, thank you so much for stopping by and sharing this information. Absolutely. And appreciate coming by. And yeah, we're looking for a lot more information to come out on those ERP phase two and that part program sometime mid to late January. And one more thing I do want to bring up while I'm here today is... If there's any producers out there that still hasn't filed your pre-filled application that you received under what we call Phase 1A, 1B, or 1C of the ERP program or Emergency Relief Program, this Friday, December 16th, is the final day FSA will accept those. There are no late file provisions under that program, so be sure and get those pre-filled applications back by December the 16th if you have one that you haven't brought back to the county office yet. And finally, for additional questions, as always, please reach out to your local FSA administrative offices. Our staff are there to serve you, the farmer and or rancher, and explain these programs and benefits so we can get the benefits where they justly deserve. That once again was Todd Barrow. He is the Farm Program Chief with the Kansas FSA State Office, joining us for an FSA update. We'll be back with more shortly on Agriculture Today. This is Agriculture Today. We are joined now in studio by Raymond Cloyd. He is a K-State professor and extension specialist in horticultural entomology. And he's joining us today to talk through some biological control agents. So, Raymond, thanks for joining us. Thank you very much, Samantha, for inviting me. Yeah, absolutely. So, like I said, we're talking through biological control agents. So, for those tuning in, they're like, what is that? Let's start with what it is. Well, let's talk about what biological control is and what it isn't. Biologic control is the release or introduction or conservation of uh, natural enemies or beneficial insects such as parasitoids and predators. From our standpoint, for our discussion today, it's mostly the release of these BCAs, biocontrol agents, in production systems like greenhouses is the main one, but high tunnel might be another one. So this is utilizing the, uh, we call the good guys and gals against the bad guys and gals that are out there overall. And that's really what, that's what biologic control is. It's, it's not elimination, eradication, it's sort of a management uh, regulation of the pest populations below damaging levels. Sure, absolutely. I think we all hear the word pest and we automatically just have a negative connotation associated with it. But a lot of the times these beneficials, these certain types of pests, they're actually pretty good to have around. So what are some of those specific ones? Well, pests are a pest, but when you look at the overall uh, insect pests, it's like 10% of the over 1 million insects that are out there. Most of them fall under like pollinators, consume, uh, consumers, decomposers, and then we call natural enemies. Those are, the again, the parasitoids uh, and the predators that are naturally regulating insect or mite pest populations. And without those, the, the insect pests or my, and even mite pests would be unregulated and they can produce tremendous amounts of offspring. That's why in the insect world, it's a numbers game. Many of these insects produce tremendous amounts of offspring because they know mortality, not just from natural enemies, but because of weather and other factors involved. But yeah, this is that, that we call the balance of nature, as Rachel Carson would say, of the natural regulation of pests by the natural enemies that are existing already in the environment. Absolutely. So we have some specific ones we want to talk through today. What are some of those? Well, what we're doing is uh, one of our goals is to develop more of these extension publications related to biocontrol agents. We have many of them related to insect and mite pests, but uh, there are a lot of ones that we work with in our laboratory and others that uh, we think need to have the information out there. And one of them, the first one we're developing, is on row beetle. Delosia coriara, which is a predatory bug of fungus ant larva, which is a pest in greenhouse production systems and western flower thrift pupil stages. So that's the first one. We'll be developing additional ones coming in the future next year on wi fly parasitoids. And this kind of extends the well, it expands the breadth of our portfolio 
but also highlighting the importance of biocontrol agents. I mean, right now, the use of insecticides and miticides in production systems is not just greenhouse, but all other production systems is sort of on the, not the ropes, but it's sort of stagnant. And the reason for that is because emerging companies, rules and regulations, and fewer active new ingredients being introduced. The main reason for switching is the resistance, the resistance issues to many of the insecticides and miticides to various insect or mite pests. So we see producers in Kansas switching over to biocontrol agents because of that main factor of resistance and the overall uh, the benefits of it. There's always a cost issue, but when we look at overall the cost of a releasing BCAs or biocontrol agents is actually can, is less than applying a insecticide because these insecticides are uh, substantially expensive because the greenhouse market is basically a specialty market. It's not like the cash cows like corn, soybean, rice, and, and those crops. But also there's the aspect of no personal protective equipment, no restricted inter- entry intervals, no resistance. You can apply them any time. There's no residues on plants, so employees and customers don't have to worry about any uh, side effects of residues. So there's a lot of indirect effects that are associated with using these BCAs. Sure, and I'm sure some time is saved there too, right? You think about the amount of time it takes to apply some pesticides and things like that. This is, I guess, less time-consuming in some ways. Well, that's a good point. It's not that it's too time-consuming, but you've got flexibility for application. Mm -hmm. If you're going to apply an insecticide and, let's say, has a four-hour REI, you apply it at night because you don't want to be in there. These biocontrol agents, you can apply them during the daytime and morning when anybody's there. In fact, one of our producers has his daughters go out there and place the release cards for the wifely parasitoids among the, on the crop. I mean, that's just the system allows it to occur because you're not applying any of these toxins that could be harmful to humans. Would not be the same with the alternatives that we just talked about. <laughs> no. Probably wouldn't have your young daughters out there. No, them. not when you're, no, they're, well, they're not even certified. So yeah, yeah. You, they couldn't do it anyway. Sure. I know you said you're hoping to release more material on some of these biological control agents. So in the future, where can producers look to find more of that information at? Well, again, everything is going to be related to the bookstore, the Kansas State University bookstore. Your uh, county's offices, extension offices may have these, or they can download them easily online as PDFs. So nothing has changed there, Samantha, from what we've done before. I mean, these will be available either online at the bookstore or as PDFs uh, on request. Yeah. Absolutely. And you mentioned the rove beetle. Are there any other insects that we should be looking out for for publications on? Well, I think if the planets are all lined up and things go to plan, the next one I'll do is Aramosser ceramicus. And that's a fancy name for a whitefly parasitoid that attacks the greenhouse and sweet potato whitefly, which are major pests in greenhouse production systems and also outdoor production systems. The one after that will probably be in Carcer Formosa, which is another whitefly parasitoid. And then we like to do one on the uh, insidious flower bug, which is a predatory bug of thrips and other soft-bodied arthropods. So, again, we're trying to expand go a different direction. We have uh, a plethora of publications on the pests, but now we need to look back and say, what about the beneficial or the biological control agents? We need, I think we need to get education material out for those that are interested in learning more about those types. Yeah, especially as, you know, we move further and further away from insecticides, pesticides, things of that sort, and we kind of look for alternatives. So this is a great opportunity to help with that. Right. And these that we're writing about are commercially available from distributors and suppliers, most of them. So the, the spectrum of the information is, is very wide. And so if you're in, you know, Maine or or California, Washington, Florida, the information will be suitable because you'll be able to get these biocontrol agents from the various suppliers, distributors that are out there. It isn't restricted just to Kansas. It's pretty much for the United States and possibly parts of Europe and Canada, too. Wonderful. So it's an accessible tool as well, not one that you face many restrictions with. No. I mean, the the bottom line is just getting the accurate information. That can be sort of difficult because there's a lot of information out there. But we've been conducting research with the insects we are writing about. So we have pretty good strong background and information base to uh, develop accurate information for the users. Absolutely. Well, wonderful. Good to know that there's information that's going to be coming about about these beneficials that can, like you said, be used pretty much year round in some of these scenarios when it comes to greenhouses and things like that. Yeah, in green now some greenhouses production systems will go fallow, but some like 5H greenhouse, the Jason and John Hoopy and Wamigo, they're year round. So we're working with them a three year project for biocontrol and it's been very highly successful on the bedding plants, chrysanthemums and poinsettias. 
but yeah, I mean, that's where they're mostly used because of the restricted environment and the conditions for temperature are optimal. Right. Because these, these are living organisms. They have optimal temperatures and relative humidities and day lengths that they need to succeed. So it isn't the same as just mixing a pesticide and applying it. You have to know a little more about the biology, ecology, and behavior of these natural enemies. And that is why we're developing these extension publications. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I'm sure those tuning in that are looking for more information, they'll look forward to hearing and looking for those resources. But we'll link to the ones that are already available in the show notes of today's program, which can be found on agtoday.net as always. But Raymond, mm-hmm. thank you so much for coming in today. You're welcome, Samantha. I look forward to uh, doing it again. Absolutely. Once again, that was K-State professor and extension specialist in horticultural entomology, Raymond Cloyd, joining us to share some information on biological control agents, including some beneficial insects. Before we cut to a short break here momentarily, the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration has denied a long-term exemption for livestock haulers. The Kansas Livestock Association's Vice President of Communications, Scarlett Hagens, says the exemption would have provided greater flexibility for haulers to complete their critical deliveries. The National Cattlemen's Beef Association has been working with the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration for months to allow additional time on the road for truckers transporting livestock and to make them exempt from some hours of service rules. The livestock industry will retain the 150-mile air radius exemption on the front and back of shipments, but the agency has denied the hours of service request, which puts producers at a real disadvantage. The agency rejected the exemption, saying it would not meet an acceptable safety level for drivers. However, the current rules do not take into consideration the well-being of the animals being transported. Hours of service rules limit livestock haulers to 14 hours of on-duty time and a maximum drive time of 11 hours, then require 10 consecutive hours of rest. These time requirements are insufficient for most trips made by livestock haulers and fail to accommodate the realities of hauling live animals across the country. Unlike drivers hauling consumer goods, livestock haulers cannot simply pull over for several hours when they run out of drive time. Livestock cannot be left idle on a trailer for long periods of time. Unloading can only occur in special facilities and repeated loading and unloading strains animal welfare. The National Cattlemen's Beef Association will continue to look at any possible legal or congressional recourse. Staff also will again petition the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration to reconsider or compromise. I'm Scarlett Hagens. Once again, that was Scarlett Hagens, the Vice President of Communications for the Kansas Livestock Association, sharing insight on the decision made by the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration to deny a long-term exemption for livestock callers. We'll return with more shortly on Agriculture Today. This is Agriculture Today. We're ending today's programming with our Beef Cattle Institute's Ask the Experts. As always, we are joined by a few K-State experts, and this week those include Brad White, Bob Larson, and Philip Lancaster. They're answering a listener's question on culling in a small herd with confirmation issues. Hi, welcome to Beef Cattle Institute's Ask the Experts. I'm Brad White, and joined by two of our experts today, Dr. Bob Larson. Hey, good morning, Brad. And Dr. Philip Lancaster. Hi, Brad. This is the show where our experts answer your questions. We always appreciate you sending them in. If you want to send in a question to us, you can send one to bci at ksu.edu. And with each question, we'll get a response from the experts. They each get a chance to respond and get up to 10 points based on their responses. Today's question comes from a listener that's asking about their cows, and they have a relatively small herd. They have some smaller cows. They have some of those cows that have gotten older, may have uh, misshapen hooves. They may have bad udders, but they keep getting bred. And his question was, should I cull them? And if so, when is the best time to get the value back out of those cows? Is it right after they calve when I sell her as a pair? Is it when she's pregnant or should I wait and keep her in my herd as she comes up open? Philip, what are your thoughts? Well, I'm going to first address whether you should cull them or not. And you know, one of the most uh, greatest expenses of getting a new cow into the herd is that developing that replacement heifer. And so if I have a cow that is producing a calf, even though maybe it's a little bit smaller and she's an older cow that's been around for five, six years, she's making me money. She's paid off her cost of uh, developing her into a cow. And so she's making me money at this point. So unless she does not wean a calf, then I think I would probably 
keep them around, especially in a commercial herd. But I might make sure that I'm not going to keep replacements out of her, because she, especially if she has some physical issues that are genetic. Excellent. So I think Philip's answer, and I'm going to give him eight points for following the my truck is paid for theory. Mm-hmm. Bob? Well, and I'm actually going to mostly agree with Philip in that I, I agree that the most important hurdle is that she's pregnant, and that really makes me want to keep her. But I'm going to say, yeah, some of these foot problems, some of the other conformation problems, some of those are not going to get better, and I'm really concerned about them getting worse over time, and I may want to sell her at preg check time because she is pregnant and she'll probably bring more than an open cow and I may want to sell her now so even though I'm kind of agreeing with Philip that I'm biased to keep her maybe the way I'll answer it is if I had five or six of these I'd probably pick the half at least that I thought were going to be the most trouble and go ahead and call them now that's kind of a half answer yeah, I agree. Half answer. But I was going to give you more points, but you ran a little bit over time. I so, always do. <laughs> I still got to take off points. It's in our contract. So you've got seven points. So, Philip, as you talked about culling those cows or keeping now let me reframe the question. You're going to sell a cull cow. Would you, A, sell her as a cow-calf pair, B, sell her as a pregnant cow? You know, that's a tough question, Brad, because the cow-calf pair, you know, looking at it from a buyer standpoint, calf's on the ground. So I know she's got a live calf with her, and I'm willing to pay more for her because you've taken a lot of the risk of her losing that pregnancy or the calf dying at birth or something like that out of the equation. But from the seller's perspective, I've got additional costs into her to get her to that point from preg check to calving and then and selling a live Pair. So it's really a tough call on that. What's your cost of getting her through the winter? And in the listener's question, they mentioned this year feed costs being really high. So for this particular year, that may not be a good decision. Bob? I'll lead with, of course, it always depends. But my bias would be I would probably prefer to sell her as a pregnant cow just to avoid the additional costs of feed and the labor of getting that calf on the ground. So I would prefer to sell her as a pregnant cow versus waiting for her to calve and selling them as a pair. I totally agree. I think you shift some of the risk out. You don't have that feed cost. Now, based on the year, there may be times that it makes sense to feed yeah. her and get her forward. So what we ended up with today was Philip ended up with nine and Bob, you ended up with eight. You made a good comeback, good comeback. right there. I thought it was in the cards, but it just wasn't. So this time we were able to have a great question. If you have a question for us that you'd like to ask, you can send us an email to bci at ksu.edu. Once again, those were K-State experts Brad White, Bob Larson, and Philip Lancaster for this week's BCI's Ask the Experts. That concludes today's programming. We'll be back with more tomorrow on Agriculture Today.